Good morning and welcome to another discussion on thriving beyond codependency. So if you're new to me, I'm Marshall Bircher and I help codependents restore their, their sanity, their safety, and their self by helping them heal the trauma bond and helping them come back to who they are so that they can go on and come to know who they are, love and live who they are, and create happy, sustainable relationships. In our lives. I've been at this for 12 and a half years. This, this is what I do. And today, we are going to be talking about the three causes of codependency. It's the pre- premiere of my new core healing course that's called Get Clarity, which is all about helping you understand the experience you've been ha- having with a specific type of uh, codependency. It's a, it's a type of codependency that's generated through a specific kind of relationship experience so before we get started on that i need to share this out to the community so if you're looking for a safe haven where we've got your back as you recover from codependency and you recover from what's called uh, narcissistic abuse this is your safe haven here on the internet it's a place where you get a chance to develop and strengthen your communication skills boundaries where you get understanding you get support and you get a safe shelter. The link is above on Facebook. It's below on YouTube. And if you're on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. So I'm going to hit a button here and get it in the community. Boom, there we go. So, and it's, it's working. Yay! Say hi in the comments. Let me know you're here. Glad that you're here. Hopefully, today's training makes an impact on you. So... In this, uh, I want to give a little overview of what I'm doing here. So, Get Clarity is a course I've created. This is part of it. It's a live thing I do here on Facebook and through email. And the goal here is to help you understand your experience so that you can see that you can heal. You can see that there is sanity behind the crazy that you've been living through that you're not the problem. It's the dynamic that was the issue. And so it's the real goal is to help you get clarity on what you've been through, how to heal it, and where to go from there. So that's the goal of this series. We're gonna be doing this series for a little while because there's a lot to cover so that you can understand your experience and be able to make effective decisions for your own healing and joy and recovery after narcissistic abuse. And I start this out with the three causes of codependency. Now I've got some notes here that keeps my brain sane on this. So I'm going to pull that up right there. Okay, I'm going to put that there. <laughs> so codependency is not, it, it, it's a result. So the first thing you want to understand is that codependency is a coping strategy. It is a means by which our brain develops in order to survive abuse, neglect, and chaos. That's its goal. That's what it's there for. So it's, I look at it as a brilliance in our brain that says, well, man, I can't get my needs met. I can't get my wants met by being assertive or by being direct or by being myself. So I'm going to become what I think they want me to be. Technically, what's going on in the background here is your brain is responding to a threat. So when the brain encounters a danger, it has four options to choose from. That first option is fight. It's going to go out. It's going to neutralize the threat. That requires the person to feel capable of neutralizing the threat. And a lot of times, for many of us, we're dealing with our parents and we're a child when this kind of cycle starts. We don't have the power to do that. We intrinsically, instinctively know we can't do that. So we might choose fleeing or flight. This is where the brain determines it can escape the threat and restore its safety by gaining distance. As a child, we can't escape it. As an adult in an abusive relationship, our brain is not able to calculate its ability to get out of there and stay safe yet. So the brain goes to two other options. So if it can't fight and it can't flee, it's going to choose a freeze and it's going to choose what's called fawning. So freeze is where we brace, we hold, we wait, we hold our breath, we wait for it to pass, we play dead. 
That's the goal of freeze is, okay, if I don't move, it's not going to kill me. It's not going to get me. And that's a temporary thing. And then if freeze works, especially if we're in a relationship, the brain has to determine how am I going to survive dealing with this person. This is where fawning comes in. Fawning is the response in the brain that says, if I make myself appealing to this individual, I will get love and I will survive. And maybe, maybe if I become just perfect enough, they will love me and I will feel valuable and worthy and lovable. That's the goal of fawning, is to become appealing to the threat so the threat doesn't harm us. That is the genesis of codependent behavior. And this fawn response can be triggered through three specific kinds of relationship dynamics that then result in codependency. All right, so result, um, <laughs> cause number one of codependency, relationship dynamic number one is the toxic relationship. Toxic relationships run on two specific cycles. One's called the SAD cycle, which stands for seduction, abuse, and discard. This is what we experience with the other person. They seduce us, then they abuse us, and then they discard us, and then they come back around and seduce us again sometimes, and we go back through the abuse and back through the discard. Round and round and round we go. So that's the, the relationship dynamic. Emotionally, the target or the codependent's experiencing their own emotional cycle, and that is euphoria. Hey, they're seducing me. Oh, my word, someone likes me. Someone like this wants me. They value me. They're really into me. I'm finally hearing things I've always wanted to hear. That would be the euphoria. This is where we create a fantasy about this person. And we'll get more into this in future, in future clarity classes here. So we go through euphoria, then we go through distress because when the abuse starts, we start to feel the distress. We're like, what did I do? What's wrong? What's happening here? I don't understand. This is completely opposite of what it was when we started. I'm confused at what's going on. And then the in distress, we tend to try to get it to work. We either become more perfect, we try to do the healthy thing and address the problem and, and assert a boundary and they tear us down for it and they abuse us for it. This is that cycle right there, abuse and advocacy slip. And then this is where the fawn starts. This is where we get triggered into a fawn state and then we try to please and become perfect to them. And eventually they get tired of us and they discard us and this leaves us with the third element of emotional of this emotional cycle which is despair this is where we feel gutted where we feel worthless we feel non-existent we feel a deep depth of 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 despair of depression of emptiness and we wonder what we've done to deserve this we we look at ourselves as intrinsically and wholly unworthy sometimes disgusting, sometimes maybe we don't even want to exist. That's the what's called EDD cycle, which is the emotional component to the seduction, abuse, discard relationship cycle. So that's relationship type number one that generates codependency. This is my specialty. This is the kind of codependency I focus on. It's the codependency that I have a lot of personal experience with and working out and have been very effective in helping people break free of that dynamic. So relationship type number two is the emotionally unavailable relationship. This is where attachment styles come into play very, very uh, clearly. So what happens in childhood is we develop an emotional experience or an attachment experience with um, our parents and it'll be one of four things or a combination of them it could be i feel secure with my parent i can be who i am they'll love me they're reliable in their responses um, i feel safe being myself with them i feel seen valued and sheltered by them then we have what's called anxious attachment anxious attachment is i'm not sure what's going to happen to me um, they're unreliable but sometimes they're really warm um, they're not generally abusive, but they're not available or not attuned. Um, and we feel a little confused about their messages because they're hot and cold. right? And then there is the avoidant attachment. And this is where the individual feels smothered and controlled and boxed in by the expectations and the demands that the other person has put upon them. 
This is where an overbearing parent is smothering a child, trying to get the parent's needs through the child. And so the child wants space, and they want independence, they want freedom from the other individual, so they run. So the avoidance run, anxious chase. And, this partic and then we have the fourth one, is the disorganized attachment, which is a combination of avoidant and anxious, where the person runs towards the person and pulls away and runs towards the person and pulls away and they're highly conflicted about getting their need met they're very scared another term for uh, disorganized tends to be fearful avoidant so th those kind of those align there well in the second type of relationship dynamic this emotionally unavailable relationship you have an avoidant and you have an anxious person and they're constantly chasing or running from each other so the anxious wants more attention, more proximity. The avoidant runs away and says, get away from me. I don't want to deal with you. Or they just cut you off. They stonewall you. You don't hear anything from them. This creates and activates the fawn response in the anxious attacher, where they're trying to be more and more pleasing and appealing towards the uh, avoidant. But the avoidant keeps pushing them away because they, they don't, the anxious person doesn't understand they're encroaching on space. And so you get into that dynamic, and that can turn toxic. That can be, well, intrinsically, unavailability is toxic. <laughs> it harms everybody involved. Um, but it can be verbally and emotionally violent to the, to the anxious and to the avoidant person. The avoidant person tends to try to control the avoidant individual. So the anxious one wants control and tries to force them to be something that they don't want to be. And the avoidant person tries to get space from them by verbally or emotionally kicking them so they'll stop interacting with them it's a very painful dynamic there i work somewhat with this i mean this plays a role in the seduction abuse discard dynamic and the edd discard dynamic but largely emotionally unavailable relationships don't have the level of toxicity that the sad or narcissistic abuse relationship dynamics do then we have number three, which is I call the well-intentioned but neglectful relationship. This is typically a parent-to-child relationship where the parent is providing for the basic needs of the child and showing up in some fashion, but the parent's not necessarily attuned to the child. So the child doesn't come to know themselves very well. They feel invisible. They feel... Um, there's a word I use. Yeah, they feel invisible, they feel unknown, and they feel unwanted in that relationship because the the person just isn't there. And so the the child typically is just trying to figure out themselves. This is really common with parents that are either you know you got single parent households where the parent is working, so the child's home alone a lot, or where the parent is not emotionally attuned because of their own trauma or lack of capacity or awareness or skills and that kind of thing i work on this a little bit there is a powerful and fantastic resource on this from a lady named jonas webb she wrote two books one called running on empty and the other one is um it's about it's the sequel to that i don't recall the title of it but she terms it as as um, childhood emotional neglect and that CNN, Childhood Emotional Neglect, is involved in all three of these types of relationships, so I address them in that. But specifically with number three, there's different things that need to happen there that I don't necessarily address um, directly. So my specialty is in relationship style number one. We're dealing with the SAD cycle and the EDD cycle, so emotional abuse, um, sometimes physical abuse, Certainly the uh, mental psychological abuse that comes with being seduced, abused, and dis abused and discarded. This is what I help you recover from. And the codependency that results from each of these is largely the same set of skills where we're, we're avoidant of conflict, we're people-pleasing, we are disconnected from our feelings, we are more what's called other-oriented or, as I call it, externally oriented. I seek myself through the eyes of others. 
Um, these are all common amongst all three of them. So when we approach codependency, I approach it from addressing the, these core behaviors and the core result, the core cause rather, which is the fawn response. It's the lack of safety we feel to be ourselves that leads us into the fawning response. In this, if we've got real, you know, we've got trauma in there, then we have to work with the freeze response as well and help the body feel safe so it can thaw emotionally. And through that thought, it can become reconnected to itself, thus restoring sanity, safety, sanity, and self through healing this impact on us. Because when we, when we thaw from the, the freeze response and we disengage from the fawn response, we're giving our brain the space to re-engage with healthy fight and healthy flight. This is how we move completely out of a codependent dynamic. As we realize it's time to fight. Fight might be asserting a boundary. It might be having more direct, clear, and simple communication. It might be saying a no. It might be physically defending yourself. It might be time to leave. It might be time to flee from this. So that means leaving toxic relationships, situations, or dynamics. It means leaving things that don't work for you. So it's not just the toxicity. It's the emotional unavailability. It's the neglect. It's the lack of something that really matters to you. Well, hey, this isn't there. I'm going to leave. This is what's important to us. This, this is what is essential to us in healing our codependency. Okay? Now, understanding which one you're coming from is going to be important in outlining what kind of support and system you need in order to truly heal and thrive beyond the experience you've had. So if being seduced, abused, and discarded resonates, if feeling euphoria, distress, and despair resonates, working with me is going to be a, a powerful option for you because that's what I address. Now, if you're dealing with largely emotionally unavailable relationships, then what I do will resonate, but there's going to be things that don't really fit for you because you're not necessarily going through the intensity of the seduction abuse discard cycle. You're just dealing with someone who's emotionally unavailable. And so um, I would look for work on, or, or people who are specialized in dealing with uh, anxious attachment development and healing that so that you can then identify and choose more secure partners in your world. Because frankly, you're not going to change anyone. Dating someone, getting to know them, building a relationship with them isn't about hoping they'll change. It is about accepting how, them as they are and building a relationship based on who they show up as, not who you hope they'll become. And then with number three, I definitely recommend Jonas Webb's material and work on healing childhood emotional neglect. So going forward, all my work and all my focus is on the toxic relationship dynamic. So when you work with me, you're, you're watching these trainings, you're on my YouTube, you're on my Instagram, you're in the community, all of my work is focused in that cycle. I do address the other ones because they are components of this type of relationship, but they're not the dominant focus. So the reason I'm sharing this is so that you can make an effective choice as to what matters to you and what you need so that you get the help and the support that you need that's really relevant to your healing and well-being. Now, let's see. Those are the three causes of codependency. They are a reason, codependency is a result of these things. All of them trigger the fawn response at certain levels. Now you're gonna find throughout your life, and you probably notice this, that you may not fawn with everybody. If you don't fawn with everybody, that's an important signal. It's an signal that you're probably dealing with number three or number two. But if you find yourself fawning with everyone, just there, there's no one you really can assert yourself with, you're scared of it in general, you're dealing with number one. So that can give you some clarity uh, or some criteria that clarifies where to go and what to look for in your assistance, whether it's with me or with other individuals who assist narcissistic abuse survivors um, in this or individuals who've gone through a seduction abuse discard cycle. Now, narcissistic abuse is a very specific term. 
this is a very specific kind of abuse because it has an element to it that is grandiose through the other person. It is the other person absorbing you. You are an object to them. You are the cookie that they want. And so they have no regard for your well-being. They have no expressed empathy for the impact they have on you. They have no awareness of themselves and how their behavior affects you or others. They feel chronically like they're a victim, especially if you hold them accountable for something. They cry victim. They're always the victim. And they're usually the worst. You know, they're the most victimized ever. So narcissistic abuse has those four specific elements. They lack empathy. They have an absorption. They want to consume you. They see you as an object or as a possession. They have an utter disregard for boundaries, so they just completely violate it. They lack accountability. They don't care. And you'll also notice in our fifth element, but they tend to make everything about themselves. And sometimes if you're dealing with someone who is actually grossly narcissistic, They'll be like, you, you should be grateful I'm in your life. I mean, my word, who would love you? You'll find out nobody would love you except me. That is a narcissistic, that's <laughs> narcissistic abuse 101 right there. These are individuals, these are brains that look at people as objects. They look at them the same way you would look at a donut. Mm, I want that donut. You're not considering the donut. You don't consider how it feels. You don't consider what it's doing in its day. You just want that donut. And then when you're done, you discard the, uh, the wrapper it came in. You're not sitting there thinking about it. <laughs> you're enjoying the donut. Narcissistic people view people that way. They are an object. They are means to an end for them. They provide what's called supply. Supply to a narcissistic individual is a sense of power. It's a sense of existence. I call it narcissistic inflation. It's where they become themselves by feeding off the other person. It's a predatory energy. It's a vampiric energy. And they do this because they are in black hole. They have no self. They have no internal locus of self. And so they've got to consume it from others because they don't have their own internal generator. So that is what I focus on, is helping people recover from the abuse cycle, seduction, abuse, and discard with people like that. So let me know what you think in the comments below, guys. Today, I want you to take a moment and see where your codependency, if you're dealing with codependency, because not everybody is, where it comes from, which one resonates most for you, and then start doing your research as to what you need in order to thrive beyond it because that's ultimately my goal for you is to discover that you too can be happy after these kinds of relationships and that includes knowing loving and living who you are that includes having relationships where you're valued where you're seen loved and valued for who you are and you're not used you're not just an object you're not just a, an appliance to them in some way the person enjoys you they like you they appreciate you they see you and they value you. That's my goal for you. Okay. So uh, take some time, consider which one resonates most with you, and then start your research on what you need in order to heal. If you got questions, leave them in the comments below. I'll be glad to respond to them. Join the community above on Facebook, below on YouTube. And again, if you're on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. Tomorrow, we're going to be going into a deeper look because I wrote it down here. I've got this little schedule. Um, we're going to talk more about those four F's of danger, the fight, flight, freeze, and fawn responses so that you can understand where your body's coming from, what we do with it. Okay. Appreciate you guys. Be safe out there, and I will see you in our next discussion.